of James today, so if you have your Bible with you, grab a hold of it. Right back to chapter 5, and we're going to look specifically at a couple of things that James says is vital if you're going to be able to stand up to the withering pressure of facing the hardship of being dispersed. Now, how many of you are instantly or recognize the stress level goes up when you're away from home? Anybody leave home, go, you're, you're out of the house and you're living somewhere else for a while, staying at a hotel or someone else's house or your in-law's house and you just start to, and the stress goes up. Is there anybody? Imagine the believers in Jerusalem were dispersed because of the persecution of Assyria and Babylon, and out they go, pressed and dispersed around the um, Middle Eastern region, and now they're away from home, and the stress level is through the roof. And here's what James says. You can be stressed, and I know you're facing all kinds of trouble and turmoil like poverty and persecution, but you can still live out your faith even though you're being persecuted even though you're facing um, poverty. You can still live out your faith even though your heart is drifting, your deep affections are drifting from God into worldliness, self-indulgence, materialism, and all the rest. He says you can still, your faith can still be active and you can still live out your faith even though this um, life of exile is dangerous and risky. The materialism is there to uh, grab a hold of you. Poverty is there, self-reliance, which eventually leads all of us to weakness and weariness and sin-stained living. And James says there's two ways specifically to deal with this. In the first part of chapter 5, he says one way is just to be patient while this trouble is happening. Why? Because if you're patient, you can be confident that Jesus is going to return and he's going to make just all the injustices. He is going to bring you out of poverty into the inheritance of Jesus. You're going to rule and reign with him forever. And everything that was sad and broken will come untrue and restored and renewed. You just have to be patient. And then secondly, he says, and this is what we're going to dive into today. He says, secondly, while you're being patient, you should pray. Keep on praying. Don't stop praying. In fact, the main idea um, is this. The main idea is that God has um, given you power and that you should depend on the power of God that's available to you through prayer to overcome any weakness caused by suffering, sickness, and sin. Depending on God in prayer to overcome our greatest weaknesses. What is our greatest weaknesses? It's suffering, sickness, and sin. And there is a power that's available to you, and it comes through prayer, and that power that comes to you through prayer gives you what you need, need to overcome the, the greatest distresses in our life, suffering, sickness, and sin. Now, I don't know what you're facing today. I'm assuming in a room this size with this many people that some of you are battling all kinds of suffering, hardship, distress, betrayal. Someone has rejected you. Someone has violated your own innocence. Someone has um, perhaps per uh, perpetrated some terrible sin against you, and you are suffering disruption in the home, disruption in your relationships, perhaps brokenness and betrayal from the people that you trusted the most. And some others are facing a diagnosis that makes it seem like it's going to be impossible to just keep on living the way you've been living. Everything's upside down. Everything's in turmoil. The diagnosis that came along seems like uh, nothing will ever be back to normal, and it's constant strain and stress trying to figure out if you're going to find any relief to what you're facing medically. And I mean mental illness and physical illness and emotional illness. I mean any kind of distress that happens in sickness. And ultimately, the greatest issue that we all face is the separation from God caused by our own sin, our own selfish rebellion and pride and self-reliance that keeps us from God. Ultimately, that's our greatest uh, peril because God will eventually punish sin with an adequate and just payment caused death, uh, called death, separation from God. So I don't know where you're at, and I don't know what you're wrestling with, and I just, I just know that you are. I just know that our church family is facing all kinds of um, turmoil and trouble related to suffering and sickness and sin. But James says that there is a means by which we can respond, and it's always the right thing to do. Always the right thing to do. Chapter 5, let's follow along here if you would. Chapters uh, 5, verses 13 to 18. 
Here we go. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. So when we're talking about prayer, it's important to know what do we mean by prayer? And here's one definition I really like. It's this. It's daily continuing the conversation that God has started with you. God has initiated a conversation with you. He does so through his spirit to say, I'm alive and um, I'm pursuing you and I created you to know me and worship me and God by his spirit speaks to you and you kind of wake up to him and say, I think there's a God. I actually believe there's a, 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 a father in heaven that exists. And then he speaks to us um, elaborately and comprehensively through the scripture. This is his word describing himself to us and describing how he expects us to live, what he's done, who he is. And so all of that is God talking to us. And prayer is simply responding back to God in conversation. That's all it is. And to do so on a daily, regular basis. In fact, one Puritan author said this, that breathing is an indication that a newborn is alive. Do you remember the relief when your newborn breathed and you thought, all right, we have life here. The Puritan uh, author says that prayer is, uh, in fact, an indication that a, an adult is born again. In other words, if there is no breath in the newborn, there's no life. And if there's no prayer in the believer, there is no belief. There is no conversion. There is no regeneration. So the signs of life for a child is breathing. The signs of new life for a believer is prayer. That's how vital he says that it is when, when describing what prayer is. And he reminds the Christians here, James does, that there is a provision that God has made for your healing. Specifically, the healing that God provides for those who are suffering and those who are um, stuck in sickness. Suffering and sickness. Yesterday, I um, made the decision, I don't know really why, but to run a 5K with 19 obstacles on Greek Peak Mountain. I don't know why I did that. I will never do that again, honestly. My wife had already warned me, look, this is a terrible decision. If you get injured, don't even come back. Don't hobble around here. You got a real life or real responsibilities around here. No more playing around on mountains. So there's 19 obstacles. It's a three point something mile race up and down Greek Peak. And uh, without training, I decided that'd be fun. Let's give that a try. One of the main obstacles, it's the most challenging obstacle is the rope climb. So it's a rope. I don't, can't even imagine how high it is. It's high enough to be um, disturbing. And it's a thin rope, and by the time you get there, it's a muddy rope. But it's vital. It has to be a part of the obstacles because it's a real challenge, and really everybody ought to try it to see where they're at. And you really, no matter who you are, you'll get up the rope somewhere, somehow. You'll get, uh, you may not make it all the way up to the top, but you'll be able to get, a, get some idea as to how challenging it really is. And it made me think about what James was saying here. And James is saying that essentially everybody ought to pray, but there's a specific way in which you pray. See, on the, on the rope climb, you're going to get up this high on your own, but if you use the right technique, if you know how to do it, it actually, you can find yourself going higher and higher and higher. The same is true, according to James, with our prayer. Anybody can pray. Anybody can express in conversation anything they want to to God. He's our Heavenly Father. He cares about us. He's listening to you, and He understands you. But James is saying, if you use the right, if you pray the right way, you'll go even higher. You can go even deeper. You have access to even more. You're going to discover even more about God and what you need if you know how to pray and you pray the right way. There's a part of prayer that we need to learn. And I hope that you can kind of journey with me. The six aspects of prayer that James tells us, explains to us, that help us know how to pray the right way. Six specific ways 
that he answers questions like, when should we pray? Who should we pray? Um, or, or who should pray? What should we pray about? Why should we pray? How should we pray? What should we expect when we pray? Any and all heartfelt prayer is vital to a healthy life of a believer. But there is a way to pray that helps make their lives more rewarding. Starting with, you should pray through all the ups and all the downs. If you're like most people, you pray primarily when you set aside time during what's called maybe a quiet time. Some people call it devotions or whatever. There's a quiet time. And most people have designated that as a prayer time, and I'm gonna pray during my quiet time. And then the other time some people pray is when they're in crisis. Anybody ever discovered that when you're in crisis, you think to call someone, buy a book about it, talk to your family, and maybe do a little Google search, and then when everything just kind of comes to a dead end, you say, I know what I gotta do, I'm gonna pray about this. Everything else has been exhausted, every single uh, uh, decision you've made to bring some kind of relief has hit a dead end. This is what James says, that we are to be in prayer all the time about everything every day. We pray during our ups, he says, sing praises, that type of prayer. During our downs, then you're going to be praying when you are sick or suffering hardships. It is the best response that we can give to God in every circumstance, good, bad, hard, or happy. Always be in prayer about everything all the time. I mean, prayer is ongoing conversation with God. And that means between quiet time in hardship and crisis that you and I can be in prayer all the time, sometimes singing, sometimes sad, but we're in prayer through all of it. Um, the next question he answers is who should pray? Who are the prayers in the church? Now in some traditions, the prayers in the church are primarily the clergy. In some, can, in some tribes of God's church, there are people, there are tribes that believe that the access that God, that you have to God comes through professional clergy. Here in our church family, we uh, believe that Jesus is the only go-between between between us and the Father and that we are all priests as believers and the priesthood of all believers means there's no professional prayers, anybody can pray. Anybody who belongs to God, believes, certainly can pray. And here's how he describes it. He says, you should both call for the elders, church leaders, and also keep on praying for one another. So there's two kinds, two groups, two categories of people who should be in prayer. Call for the leaders. If somebody is too sick, they're lame, and they can't get themselves to the, um, to the church family for prayer, then certainly the elders are invited to come and make the trip. And maybe if James was talking to our televangelists who are healing evangelists on TV, maybe James would say, why do you make the lame people come to you? You should be going to them. And what he's describing here is that there are times where somebody is so sick that they can't make it among the body and that the church leaders would go and they would bring oil and they would uh, um, anoint them with oil. And we'll talk about that in a second. And what that means is that they don't just hear the prayers, they can feel the prayers. They can feel uh, the elders laying hands on someone. But also, James is um, referring to prayer among the body. Now on Sundays here, um, during our communion ceremony, we have oil available. And the elders who are anointing with oil, you'll, you'll see it here. You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's two prayers there, the elders and also the believers. And it talks about anointing with oil. And we use oil here during our uh, communion service prayer time, and we have these little vials of oil, but we use it differently than James's culture did. In James' culture, when someone was weak or weary or they had just finished a day's work, in order to clean up and be refreshed, they would be anointed with oil, their head and their hair and their skin, and they would be revived. They would be kind of lifted up. They would be refreshed and renewed. Aren't you glad we don't use our oil to substitute for a shower for you on Sunday morning? Instead of using oil as a replacement shower, we use oil as kind of a symbol. And it wouldn't be unusual for one of our church family to pray for someone and put a little oil on their forehead, not 
trusting and believing that the power is in the oil. It's actually in the name of the Lord, but it serves as a symbol of the healing work of the Spirit, that there is a practical way of touching someone and having the, um, the refreshing and the renewing and the revitalizing healing power of oil through the work of the Spirit to just symbolize that God's at work and we're trusting Him through the work and power of the Lord and uh, symbolize it with oil. So when we pray... On a regular basis, we will use that as a symbol. But if we were really in the Middle Eastern culture doing it James's way, you'd have, a, you'd have an anointing oil bath. When I got ordained um, in 1996, there was a well-known church leader who did the ordaining and was famous for the ordination anointing with oil session. And he did the same to me that he did to everybody. That is, when it's time to anoint you with oil, he dips his hand in a bucket and then lets you have it. Big old explosion of oil all over. To this day, I have oil on my stole and my tie, which I wanted a replacement tie, to be honest. It was about three bucks. It's all oily. But we don't function that way, and um, that's how it would have happened then. And the elders would have gone, anointed the sick, and would have refreshed them. And, 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 and um, it's an indication there that what James is talking about is that this healing oil would function naturally to bring strength to somebody, someone who's weary and weak, but also supernaturally that God could raise them up. Um, now, the important fact that is, is that it's the Lord, not the power of prayer or the oil who will raise them up. It also, what James also says here is that there's no professional prayers, that it ought to be normal and natural that believers are saying things to each other like, can I pray for you? And it'll all be natural and normal for us as believers to be confessing our sin to someone who is in the body. Not just confessing our sin to a clergy, but confessing our sin one to another. And that as we do that, there is some, um, there is some level here of connection and care that we give to each other. Anyone in the church family should pray for anyone at any time. So what should we pray about Next. Next, number three, what should we pray about? You should pray about your weaknesses, emotional weaknesses, physical weaknesses, spiritual weaknesses. Are any of you suffering hardships? What do you do? You should pray. Are any of you sick? What should you do? They should pray over you. If you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And uh, we learn that prayer is something special. Now, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Here's what prayer is, and here's what prayer does. Prayer is the practical expression of my total and utter 100% dependence on God. When I pray, what I'm saying is I depend on God. Totally, utterly, completely, comprehensively, and thoroughly. Secondly, prayer is the practical acceptance of my deep and comprehensive need for his help. When you pray, you're saying, I don't have what it takes to help myself. When you pray, you say, it isn't enough to just have talent. It isn't enough to just have a treasure. It's not enough to just have resources that God has given me. I actually need God himself. And every time we pray, it's calling on God himself, saying, I need him. I'm comprehensively uh, in need in every possible way for God's intervention. And in fact, I'm totally dependent on God too. So the question that's being asked by James is this. Are you suffering? Are you sick? Are you trapped in sin? You're weak and weary from your sickness or sin? And there is no reason to believe that James, when he says the word sick, is only talking about physical sickness. We certainly believe he is talking about physical sickness. The word that he uses is weakness or weariness, and certainly sickness puts someone in a weak and weary state. But you know what else does? It is also the, our sinfulness that causes us to be weak and weary. I don't know if you've come across somebody who's lived a hard life, but at times you can tell somebody has lived such a rebellious life separate from God, it almost looks like life has run them over several times. Life can be so... Um, brutal to people who are living far from God, separately on their own, living for themselves by themselves. And it's, it's quite important for us to recognize that James is describing those people who are not just physically ill, but spiritually ill, separated from God. 
They're far from God, separated from God, and their life has done all kinds of damage to them and to others. And now they suffer in the weakness and weariness and sickness of having lived in rebellion far from God. Every time I get a headline that comes across my uh, screen and I see that there's another drunk driver fatality, I instantly think of the two lives and families that were destroyed. It isn't just the person who um, is killed and now their family has to go on with life suffering through the loss of a loved one. We also know that the person who may be addicted to substance has gotten in a vehicle and killed somebody and their life is ruined. And what James is saying here is that a life of sinful addiction and other patterns of sin will bring ruin to someone's life and there are times when prayer is simply admitting that we have a weakness and we have a weakness and, 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 and sinfulness that needs to be healed and only God can bring healing both physically and spiritually. And James is describing that's what we pray for. Now, there is a connection between sickness and sin. Sinful lives bring bitterness and brokenness and weariness, shame, hopelessness. And somehow there's a connection here in James between being sick and confessing our sin. And if we confess our sin and someone prays for us, God makes us well. And there's probably a, a hundred ways to really overdo this and distort it. Can you imagine if you really start to believe deeply that every time someone suffers, there must be sin in their life, right? We, I mean, we preach against that constantly here, saying, no, there are circumstances that come from the fall and that come from uh, just the sin of the world being broken that people suffer. But James is saying there's some kind of connection between the two, and it's possible that God has used sickness, he's withheld health in order to judge someone or discipline someone in an attempt, in a means by which he's trying to provoke their full repentance and return to God. We don't know what kind of uh, um, sickness, we don't know how it looks, we don't exactly know how God uses it, but we do know that James is arguing that it would be better to take care of the sin before it continues to cause severe illness. You might as well come clean and confess it so that you can find relief. And certainly God isn't gonna withhold forgiveness. We know that at times he withholds health. No elder is needed for each believer is a, is a, has the means of asking for forgiveness and, and confessing one to another. But there seems to be a connection between sickness and sin when the former is disciplined from God for the latter. God's discipline on his people was to, was to withhold rain. He mentions Elijah, and so, for some of the Corinthians, God withheld health, and God does so for full repentance. And James, at this point, is saying that the weak and the weary can be refreshed, encouraged, and uplifted when they're rubbed with oil and despondent heads, and, 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 and um, they can be prayed for. The fallen, the discouraged, and the distressed, weary believers can be fully restored by the prayers of the elders who pray in faith and the believers who pray after sin and confession. And that there's strength that comes to the soul that's needed. The restoration is both physical and also spiritual. The next question that is worth asking, and James tackles it here, is why should we pray? You know, if you talk to people in our culture, they're going to say that power comes through education. And certainly makes total sense that educating oneself brings power to one's life, right? It certainly makes sense that the more you know, the more powerful you are in your life. It's also true that some people would say if you need power in your life, it comes through positive thinking. If you have positive thoughts, positive vibes, positive energy, and if you gather up all that positivity, good things are going to happen to you, and that's the power that you need. James is seeing, saying this, that we're deeper in need than we can ever imagine, and neither education nor positive thinking is going to help us in that time of need. In fact, what he goes on to say is this, you should pray to seek God's healing and forgiveness because that's the deepest need that we have is healing and forgiveness. You should pray about your weaknesses and then you should pray to seek God's healing and his forgiveness. Such a prayer will make you well. You will be forgiven. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. So there you see. Such a prayer will make you well, you'll be healed, you will be forgiven, and you will be healed physically and spiritually. God's providing what we needed in, in healing and also providing what we needed through forgiveness. 
Now, if you're not praying, it's safe to say, this is true for humans, if we're not praying, it's safe to say, I don't really need God. I got this on my own. I don't really have a need for him to heal me. I don't have a need for him to forgive me. And it may be that we're quietly confident that our time, our money, and our talent are all we really need. Well, James says, and, and this is also taught by Jesus, that we approach God in a childlike way, meaning that we can't really help ourselves, we have to depend on our parent. And that our prayers, as childlike, simply says, we're helpless, we're needy, and we approach him in prayer because we are desperate for his help. And if we have a spirit of pride, if we have this attitude, we're prideful, and we're certainly, um, uh, if we're independent and self-reliant and we're rebellious, then certainly um, we would not need to pray. But if we're desperate for God, we'll learn to pray fervently. A needy heart is a praying heart. Dependency is the heartbeat that drives all of our prayers. And when healing does come, it's always a gift from God who's sovereign. And you know he's sovereign all disease, right? He's sovereign over all sickness. He's sovereign over all illness and all, certainly all of our health. The second need that we have isn't just physical healing, but it's also forgiveness, the forgiveness of sin. It's the most severe sickness. Why? Because it leads to eternal death, separation from God. And we can, uh, we can only truly expect, rely on, and hope that God will intervene with forgiveness. Look what John says. He writes about it here, and he says, if we confess, if you're willing to confess, God will respond. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful, and he is just, and he does, and he forgives us our sins, and he cleanses us from all wickedness. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins. And he doesn't just forgive us and leave us alone. He cleanses us of our sins. He takes the robes, the holy, righteous, pure, supremely righteous robes of Jesus and he wraps them around us. And now instead of sinking in our sin and being condemned and separated from God, he takes our sin and he separates it as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness. And now God forever and always only sees us wrapped in the robes of Jesus' righteousness. And that's how he brings forgiveness upon your confession and repentance. He himself says you will be forgiven. He himself says you will be healed. He himself says these prayers of forgiveness will make you well. The sick person becomes physically healed and the sinful person becomes spiritually healed through salvation. And Jesus, of course, you remember if you follow this at all, there's a great series out. It's an app called The Chosen. It's a crowdsourced series. It's got one season so far, eight episodes worth getting called The Chosen. And it's crowdsourced, meaning someone donates money so that you can see an episode and then you donate money so someone can see an episode. But there's this great... Um, great scene where we see in the Gospels all the time where Jesus doesn't just heal somebody physically, but he also forgives them of their sin and, and, and heals them spiritually from separation from the Father forever. It's um, worth watching. So number five, how should we pray? You still with me? That was so lame. I mean, you didn't even fake it. You didn't even fake it. Still with me? Five and six, five and six. See, if I give you a second, it's the second chance. You're good at those. Number five. Number five, James is describing how should we pray. You should pray in faith and in earnest. Such a prayer offered in faith, the earnest prayer of a righteous person. And faith means this. It means generally leaning the entire human personality, the entire human being, leaning that particular person upon God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, in his wisdom, and certainly in his goodness. It means that we're putting our faith in God. It's not an attempt to put faith in our faith, right? The strength of our prayer and the strength of our faith is not the amount of our faith, it's the object of our faith. And when you have the object of your faith as the mighty, the supremely mighty God, then he himself becomes the, the one in which you trust is gonna be at work by his mighty power. So you're not having faith in your own faith and how you have faith and how much faith you have, but your faith is aimed at, at, at God. And when you pray in earnest, it means sincere, authentic, wholehearted. It means that you mean what you're saying when you're having a conversation with God. And for somebody to be 
um, righteous, a righteous person, we mean a believer who has been joined to Christ, who is in Jesus. And if he is joined to Christ in Jesus, that means wrapped in the robes of righteousness of Jesus. So a righteous person isn't a moral person. They're not a good person. They're not someone who is pure and holy. They're someone whose confidence is in Jesus and they're made, put in and joined with Jesus. And now they're actually a believer who belongs to God and when they pray, there's results. Every Christian can be great and every Christian can be effective in their prayer. If you count on your own righteousness, the Bible describes it as a a heaping pile of rubbish, that our righteousness is rubbish, that we approach the Father in the righteousness of Jesus. And when healing does come, spiritually and physically, it comes from God, who is sovereign over disease, illness, and health. God hears the prayers of the the, the humble, those who depend on him. And lastly, what should we expect? This is so huge. What should we expect when we pray? I don't know what you expect, but sometimes I expect nothing. When I'm praying, sometimes I expect to just provide my uh, token conversation with God. And and, um, sometimes when I'm praying, I find myself to be a realist. I'm okay with reality. I don't need it to be different. I find myself pretty content with the way things are. And, and here's what James says, though. James says that you should stop praying like that. You shouldn't pray like a realist, and you shouldn't pray like you're content that if nothing ever changed, you try to make yourself satisfied. And, of course, he doesn't mean that in, in a material way, but he means that in a faith way. And listen to what he says. Number six, you should expect results. The earnest prayer has what? Has great power and it produces wonderful results. What that means is we have the ability to pray in such a way as God will cause results to happen. Why? Because we're good at praying? No, because he's good at being God. Why? Because we're really, really, um, uh, we really mean it this time? No, because God is merciful and gracious and he's looking for ways in which he can come in and answer prayer. And he may not answer the prayers the way that we planned on him or that we have asked him to. He may answer it in his own way, but we ought to expect that when we are praying in the power of God, there is great power and wonderful results that come along with it. As an example of this kind of prayer, he mentions Elijah. And he says, pray like Elijah. And you know what I think? I'm not Elijah. I'm pretty ordinary. I don't have Elijah prayers, I have ordinary prayers. And you may look at that and think to yourself, you know what, Elijah and I are not the same. Here's the good news, the God to whom you are praying is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. This idea is not that Elijah had special prayer, it was that he was praying to a special God who was supremely mighty to do anything. To do what? To actually stop the rain and then send the rain. Wouldn't that be a great a powerful Syracuse prayer. We pray to a God who has the ability to cause atmospheric conditions in which rain comes and rain goes. And James is saying, look at the, look at the uh, size of Elijah's prayer. When God's people were in rebellion and God said, I'm gonna judge them and I'm gonna use droughts to judge them and Elijah prays and he says, God, may they experience your judgment so that they return back so that their double-mindedness and their separated heart between the world and you, may it be kind of judged and disciplined back into full repentance. And then three and a half years later, Elijah prays this prayer, God, as you've seen them in repentance, would you lift your judgment and send rain again? No more drought of discipline. Send the rain. And what does God do? He sends the rain according to his plan to bring someone's heart back to him. How does that happen? Through the key and Elijah-sized prayers, the rain-sized prayers of Elijah. And this makes me think of how lame my prayers are. It makes me think of how small, timey, routine my prayers are, as if I'm only praying to Amazon that maybe Amazon would send me something once in a while. And then it would just be, you know, the right time, the right size. Listen, God has given us access to himself who is a rain-stopping and a rain-starting God. You and I should be praying prayers that are so big they sound crazy, but they're not crazy. They're loaded with faith that God can indeed intervene and bring hope and healing to those who are suffering and sick and, and, and already entangled in sin. And God has the ability to bring full healing physically. 
He has the ability to heal mental illness and relational uh, dissolve and corruption and brokenness in the home. We should be praying prayers that are so big. We say, God, don't just help me reach one person and maybe I could mention something to help them discover who you are. But everybody all the time in all my circles, may you reach them through me with my own laid down life of love and care. But your power, not mine, I'm gonna pray as an ordinary person to an extraordinary God. He heals, he forgives, he brings life and newness, and you and I should commit ourselves as a church family to say bigger prayers, Elijah-sized prayers. Why? Because we're so terrific. No, don't forget, we're praying these prayers because our God is so terrific. I have this crazy picture in my mind that on Easter when we're heading up towards 500 people here on a Sunday celebrating the resurrected Jesus, I have this crazy picture in my mind that there's so many people here that God does something miraculous. Like there's so many people sitting in these seats that some of you have to sit in the front row. Right up here. Elijah-sized prayer. That would be a miracle. But listen, there are people who are depending on you, and I don't mean this to say you should feel guilty, but literally God wants to use you to pray prayers like, God, may I take this Easter invitation and get it to somebody so that they have an invitation to have access to the good news of a resurrected Jesus so their lives can be resurrected from death to life also. Not just someone here and someone there, but anybody always. And then we say, God, you are capable of doing this. I'm ordinary, but you're extraordinary. I'm not like Elijah, but you're exactly the same God that he prayed to. And I believe there's so much more for you through our powerful prayers that are rain size, rain stopping size of prayers. I believe there's so much available to me. There's so much available to us as a church family. What about not just reaching someone who you know, but what about the people in your life who are wandering away from God? I believe that God has the willingness and the ability to intervene and to bring back wanderers who have wandered far from God. And they are suffering on the inside because their life of entanglement and sin has started to kind of run over them like life has a tendency to do. All kinds of despair and brokenness. I'm talking about people who... uh, our spouses of ours who are still kind of undecided about what they're going to do about Jesus or maybe they're, they, they were decided and now they've wandered off, God still intervenes and he miraculously saves souls of the people that we love and they've wandered away. God still intervenes and he raises up people who've been diagnosed with illnesses that are terminal, illnesses that can't be cured, illnesses that are going to ruin and change their life. We ought to be people who are depending and trusting and saying, can I pray for you because we're praying to a God who can do wonderful things. And we do that with big faith and a big God. And it's coming from a little prayer from a little person who doesn't have much sovereignty over anything. But we're trusting that the one who is sovereign over all the universe can intervene as he pleases. Even it is, even if it's this, even if it's somehow 10, we don't know how this works, but somehow bring discipline into someone's life and it turns their hearts back to the Father just like he did to his own people when King Ahab and Jezebel were leading this wonky uh, kingdom where God's people were so uh, um, double-hearted and double-minded and and were worshiping the world and the pagan gods and also trying to worship God. And God said, I'm going to let judgment, the cloud of judgment ultimately captures their hearts again. May we pray in such a way as we believe God is healing bodies and capturing hearts. Let's do it. Let's do it together with him.